Okay, uh, this is Ben Roush who came down from Grand Rapids where apparently he runs every technical computer user group known to man <laughs> and uh, he's going to talk about Python and Android. Thank you. I subtitled this A Descent into Madness with Ben Roush because that's what I, a little bit of what I got into. Um, so who am I? By day I'm the reclusive entirety of the IT department for Van Dam Ironworks small company in Grand Rapids. By night, I stalk the mean streets of Grand Rapids as a serial user group organizer. Yeah, that, I don't run all of them, but a few. I am Ben Rausch. All right. So my motives for this talk, um, there's, there's a few. First, things I don't like, right? I don't like being told what I can and can't do with what I own, aka my phone. <laughs> I don't like artificial limitations on computers. I mean, if it's a general computing device, why are you, why are you limiting its functionality? Um, I don't like lockdown devices being pushed for education. I won't name any names there, but... And I don't like Java, also. <laughs> so, um, things I do like, Python and Android. So this is kind of a natural talk, I think. Um, what do I want to do? Uh, I'd like to explore my device's capabilities. I want to develop regular Python applications, especially web applications, on Android. So if I don't have a, uh, my laptop or computer around, I could still, you know, hack on my projects. Um, and I'd like to develop distributable Android applications in Python. So, can you hear me now? Good. <laughs> you ready to go? Okay. Um, so first, a warning. Um, I'm, I'm doing some strange and unnatural things in Python and Android that may make you uncomfortable. If it, if it gets too weird for you, feel free to leave. Um, but I think if you sat through the keynote today, you'll be all set because that was a lot weirder than the stuff I'm doing. <laughs> okay, let's script. We're going to start with the scripting layer for Android, formerly known as the Android scripting environment. What is it? It's a big old hack that gives you access to a lot of the and native Android capabilities. You don't need a rooted device for this one, which is nice. Uh, it uses RPC to communicate with the uh, underlying Android, so, which is kind of cool. Um, gives you a few different scripting languages, like Lua, Perl, JavaScript, JRuby, BeanShell, TCL, and Python, the only one we really care about today. Um, there's a list of the APIs, and I just want to run through some of those real quick because it's it's a huge list, and um, you have access to so much of the Android environment through this. It you'll hear people say it's really limited, but yeah, it's limited. But there's a ton you can do with it. Now, what it, it, they're called facades, and they're sort of breaking into groups of, of different facades. Um, so the Android facade is, is like a general Android stuff. Make toast is a little message that appears on your screen and goes away. Um, there's broadcasting. You get access to the clipboard. Vibrate. You can make it vibrate. Um, application manager things. You've got, you can get lists of what's running, what's installed. You can get battery information. Uh, Bluetooth. You can interact with the Bluetooth stuff. The camera. Common intents, um, like view HTML, your contacts, that sort of thing. There's more contact information. Uh, the event facade, uh, not sure what that is, but it's all right. Location information, media player, media recorder. So you can capture video, microphone. You can do phone stuff with it, because, you know, it's a phone. Some people use it to make calls. Um, preferences, different sensors, accelerometer, magnetometer, orientation. All the, all the sensors that are on there. Uh, you can look at settings. You can change settings. Signal strength. SMS, you can do SMS stuff on there. Speech recognition. So you can deal with uh, that stuff. I did a little, little work with that, but we're not going into that today. Um, the UI facade is how you can make all the, the dialog boxes and that sort of thing that you need. Uh, wake lock, webcam, and Wi-Fi. So there, there are tons of stuff you can do through the Android uh, SL4A. 
think I minimized that, didn't I? No, I did not. Sorry about that. Slide. I'll right, we'll hide it down there. Okay. Um, installation. I I have this uh, installation video that I'd like to show you just because I talk a little bit about it later. This is actually from YouTube because I was going to make my own, but this one was very good. And I'll talk about what's going on. So uh, first is going to settings and checking um, that you can install unknown source applications because this is not in the Play Store. You have to download it from the website. Uh, which is what they're going to do next. So we'll skip ahead a little bit to save some time. So they're going to the website, downloading the APK, and then they're going to install it. Da, da, da. Yeah, install. It takes a little while, not too long. And now here's, here's the part that I want you to pay attention to. Um, yeah, not that part, sorry. <laughs> So you install next, you have to go into the menu and then you view the interpreters, All right? And there's no, it just comes with a shell. So then you have to go into the menu and you have to add the interpreters that you want. And so they're gonna add the Python interpreter. And that downloads and then you install it. Come on. So from that point on, pay attention to how, how long this takes and what you have to do to, to get the Python part going. Uh, I'm not sure if it can go on the SD card. Probably can. So what, what they're doing now is they've installed it and opened it, but when you open it the first time, you have to install all this other stuff. And so it's actually a few minutes of things and there's you know several megabytes of information it's bringing down in all these zip files and what that is it's the python runtime and the python like standard modules and some scripts and some other stuff all comes down but it's quite a big package that you have to explicitly go in there and install after you've installed python for android so that's really what i wanted to show you there because it comes up later So there's, I didn't go through the whole video, but the list of uh, scripts that it comes with, example scripts, is pretty cool. You can go in there and, and get pretty good examples of things. Um, this one is not an example script, HTTP serve. That's one that I made and that we're going to look at. Uh, oops, sorry. It, yeah, I'll show you. Uh, I forgot to run through this one first. This shows you the, uh, this goes through the test.py, which comes with it, and that shows you a lot of the UI elements that you can, you can install. So I wanted to give you a quick look at those. This is, this is a video that I made on my phone, just running it. So you got the different alert boxes, you got the selection boxes, you got selection alerts, you got progress, progress meters. There's a couple errors on this one, but it's all right. So this is not all of the UI elements you have access to, it's just some of them. But it gives you a pretty good idea. They, they're native elements, so it sticks right in. You got passwords. Okay. Uh, right, down here now. Sorry. Hide it down there. Oops, gotta go full and then hide it. All right. Um, 
So now we'll, well, now we'll take a look at the HTTP serve. Um, there's the video. Okay, so this is a very simple script I wrote, and what it does is it uses the, the Python simple HTTP server, which you may have run into. What that does is you, you just run it, and it gives you an HTTP server. It's really simple. Um, so th what this does is let it run on your phone, on your SD card, so you can just bring it up, you know, go to your computer, download what you want off your SD card, shut it down. Real simple, but very useful. So the first thing you need to notice is the import Android. That is how you get access to everything in Android through SL4A. Um, and the rest of it is just Python imports, standard library stuff. Uh, so you go to, the first thing you do is droid equals android dot android, and that makes an Android object, which actually lets you run the functions that you need, the methods that you need. Um, we got IP declaration. So the first thing we're gonna do is find out what IP address our phone is so we can tell us, so we can download things from there. Um, droid, so we're using that Android object, that Wi-Fi get connection info. So now we're actually using that Wi-Fi facade to get the connection info. We say dot result, that's an RPC connection, so we're, we're looking at the result from that uh, facade call, and we, we want the IP address out of there. That happens to not be you know, an IP address like we think, it's a, it's a pack something or other. <laughs> so the, the second line is just unpacking that into something that we can type in. Uh, then we go to the SD card and we say, okay, connect to this IP address and we start the server and it's just there. You just go to it and you can download things and you can go into um, subdirectories. Very cool and very simple. Um, so if we wanted to know more about uh, the Wi-Fi connection info, so more about what's, what we can get from that facade call. We got that result IP address. So how do we know what else is in there, right? Well, let's go look at the documentation. That is really useful, guys. <laughs> Wi-Fi get connection info. Yeah, it returns information about the currently active. That is all the documentation on this, on this, this call. So what you end up doing a lot of is opening the interpreter on your phone and you do the same thing, import Android as a, I get a little lazy when I do this because it's the tiny little keyboard, right? So you want to save keystrokes. D equals A dot Android, so just a little bit of uh, cheating there. Get the Wi-Fi connection info and it outputs the result. So all of this is in the RPC result. Um, and the result inside there, doo -doo -doo, we have our IP address in this format. And that's, we have all this other information we can pull out of there. So you do a lot of that with all the different calls because a lot of the documentation is that sparse. It's easier to just pull it up and try it, see what you get. Um, a few other problems with this. If you're, if you're writing scripts on your phone, there's no source control, there's no easy install. You can install outside modules, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. It's not the easiest thing. Uh, there's no virtual <laughs> inf. It's annoying to type on the device, right, because it's tiny. And only Python 2.6? No. While I was putting this talk together, I learned they have Python 3 out there, too. So we could maybe be able to do Python 3. I didn't do it today, but it's available. Okay, so now that's fun. We can play with our phone. We can explore it through these various facades. Let's go to the next thing I want to do, which is develop in Python on Android. So develop regular... Python applications from my Android device. Uh, we're going to use a program called BotBrew first. What is it? Alternate Package Manager for Android. So you don't have to go through the Google Play Store or whatever they call that thing. Uh, the goal of the project from, from the guy that created it is to distribute non-app software via repositories. So you can set up your own repository and access it through BotBrew, your own app get repository. You do need root for this. I think of it as app get for Android, which it pretty much is. And it has a nice GUI to, to help you along. Okay, it's gone through a couple iterations. It's currently at one, on one called BotBrew Basil. It'll say experimental in the store, but I think it's pretty good. I think it's ready to use. So don't use the older one. Uh, the older one uses OPackage, uh, which is designed for things like open work, really tiny embedded devices. So your package selection is very sparse. Uh, BotBrew Basil is uh, based on Embedian, which if, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's uh, Debian for embedded devices. It has 
a lot more available to you. So what's available? Uh, I was going to go out and look at some, but in the interest of time, we'll just skip it. I'll say there's 3,500 packages available for this. And it's everything from you know, Python, Vim, Git. There's X server stuff, but that won't really run on Android. Uh, almost everything you would want is available out there. So how do you install it? You install BusyBox from the Google Play Store, and Bob Rubazel is out there also. Very simple to install. Then, to get Python working in your Bob Rubazel. BusyBox uh, gives you a bunch of, of uh, extra commands. Um, if you're used to Linux, you've got a, you've got a bunch of commands that you normally use. Um, I can't think of examples off the top of my head, but it gives you a few more commands. LS? Uh, probably is. It, it's a ton of things. Um, it's just sort of a nice environment to get you closer to a regular uh, Linux setup. Um, so the first thing you have to do is actually pick which repository you want. So in this case, we want Embedian repository. You then install Bob Rue Debian apt, which gives you access to the apt command. Uh, and then install the Debian minimal. And what this does is, is Android's not set up like uh, Debian, right? There's a, there's a couple issues with it. It doesn't have a user. It doesn't really have a username. Um, and there's a few other things that it's missing. So what this does is, is it, oh, it's also missing a lot of the packages. If you install base Debian, like the, as basic as you can get, there's less than that on Android. So this installs all of those pieces of Debian that programs expect to always be there. And then there's the BotBrew wrapper, which sets up an environment more like Debian, and uh, so your programs will run correctly. Then you install Python. Then you install Python setup tools. And all of these are, are available in that Embedian repository that you've, you installed first. And then you can install things like Python Dev, Vim, and Git. Right? Or I bugged this guy so much that he was really nice to me. And uh, he, he set up this, uh, this quick way to, to do it. You can just click on the Run Python Programs, and it'll do steps all the way through five there. So it'll install Python for you and do all the stuff above that. Saves you a little bit of time. Pretty cool. So let's install pip, right? We've got, we've got uh, setup tools. We've got easy install. Let's get pip on there, because that's a lot better. Open your terminal, like an Android terminal. Um, Go to super user, because you've rooted your phone, so you can super user. Now what you have to do with each command, with each program in BotBrew is you have to put BotBrew in front of it so that it sets up the environment correctly, so it runs those programs right. Um, so BotBrew, easy install pip, right? No, <laughs> that fails. Why does that fail? There's a bug in pip 1.1, which is the current version. So. To get around that, we have to install the development version of pip. So botbrew easy install pip equals dev. And now we can move on. And we want to pip install virtual env, of course, because we're going to write real, real Python programs. We want to have all the fun stuff there, all the good things you need. Um, right? No. Boom. That fails. <laughs> Why does that fail? Maybe for a couple reasons. Number one is there's your SD card is... Uh, Maybe FAT32. And there's a problem with FAT32. Most SD cards are FAT32. I don't know about most now, but many. Uh, FAT32 does not support sim linking. You cannot make a sim link on FAT32. Virtual Inv works by sim linking to System Python, right? So Virtual Inv does not work on FAT32. How do you get around that if you're stuck with an SD card? You can uh, put an extra partition on that card using something like clockwork mod or manually on your computer and install an ext2 partition and then you can do all your work in that uh, and this is actually what I did on my Nook color because that had uh, the fat 32 SD card newer phones and tablets may just be a ext4 so you may not have to deal with this at all all right so let's go let's create a virtual and we fixed our fat 32 right all right, now we're going to go. We'll make a, we're going to start a, a project. Put our virtual env inside there. No, why not? 
The same issue we had earlier with PIP. There is actually a PIP 1.1 embedded in virtualenv, so it also has the same bug that hit us earlier. And that bug affects Android. Um, I, I tried to look up the exact bug. I, I came across it like six months ago, and I couldn't find it. But the development version of PIP fixes it. So when they finally release, it'll be fixed. So to do it, we create our virtual env, and then we have to install, easy install the development version of PIP into that. Um, when you're doing the, you know, things like this where you're working in environments that people don't usually work in, like you know, creating virtual envs on Am Android, that's kind of a strange thing. You run into these edge cases, and it's just something you got to work around if you can. Yeah, it's it's tough. I I asked a question and and there were no answers on the Fat32 thing because I didn't know what was going on there. I finally figured that one out. Um, and then you can you can bot brew. So to run the Python in your virtual env, you have to prepend bot brew to it because you got to set up that environment right. So bot brew virtual env bin Python, and we have our interpreter working there, right? Oh, I just ran yoke to show you what was installed in there. But that, that gets you running. So this is Python 2.7. All right, so I want to write real programs on Android. So I decided to go full hog and just say, okay, I'm going to write a, I'm going to see if I can make a, a Django app completely on Android and deploy it to Heroku. That seemed like a pretty good stack to try, right? So let, we need to install Heroku on Android first. Uh, Ruby is in Batbrew Basil, and you need the OpenSSH client. So that installed just fine. Uh, open your terminal, super user. You have to create uh, a key gen for it. And then you have to use RubyGem to install Foreman and Heroku. They have a script. Heroku has a script for uh, Windows, OS X, and Linux to install, but there is no script for Android, so you have to do it manually, which is what this command does. Um, then you can log in, and you add your keys to Heroku, and there we go, Heroku works. No, no real issues with that one. It had to figure out the, the key thing a little bit, but it just works. So you've got status, we got, you know, my apps, We've got all that stuff. Heroku just works there. So that was pretty cool. Um, I just made kind of a standard Django app with, with nothing in it except the admin and used Git, right, because I installed Git earlier on the phone. So used Git to uh, do all the stuff I needed and deploy it to Heroku, and uh, it worked. So it was very cool. I was surprised that, that most of that stuff worked with no issues. But there were three issues I encountered, right? This one I haven't talked about yet. It's a Django bug. Um, when you do a SyncDB the first time, it wants you to create a super user. It assumes you have a user that it can grab, like a username that it can grab and, say, and suggest to you. That's all it really does with it. Android does not have that, so it fails. <laughs> so that's, that's one bug I'll be reporting to Django, and it, I think it'll be easy to fix, but who knows. Um, I also had trouble with the Psycop G2, which is a Postgres Python bindings. That would not install. Even though it was in BotBrew, it would not install. Uh, but, so the first one, the Django bug, because of that, I could not run locally. I could not test the application locally. I just had to make sure I had it right and deployed it. And with Psycop G2 in my requirements, Heroku picked it up and it was fine once it was deployed. So. There's a little trickery in there I had. Um, and Heroku open didn't work, which is supposed to open your web browser and go to your app. I guess it couldn't figure out how to open the default Android browser, but it's not a big issue. Um, annoyances about BotBrew itself, the BotBrew command. When you're so used to just typing the command and going, you having to put BotBrew in front of everything is really annoying. Uh, you're limited to what's in the Embedian. Although there is a lot, there isn't everything. And a lot of the things that are in there just don't work on Android. A lot of the X server stuff, anything with a GUI doesn't work. No GUI stuff. So that's, a, that's pretty good, and it worked. Um, but let's see if we can do more. More Python on Android, another way of, of creating projects and deploying them. 
We're going to use Linux on Android. This is another cool project. Need root for this one. It installs Linux on top of Android in a true. So you get, you get a real Linux install inside of your Android. Uh, you get the desktop GUI, which you can access via your VNC server to localhost. There's a free version. It's free. And you can donate if you really love it. I have donated because they are cool guys and it's a cool project. What's a true? A true on Unix is an operation that changes the apparent root directory for the current running process and its children. So it just changes the location of your slash that becomes the new root. I think of it as a Linux virtual machine on Android, which it's not technically, but that's how I kind of think about it. <laughs> um, what's available for Linux on Android? He's packaged up several distributions, Ubuntu 1204, the, different, the differences between them, uh, the core is just like server. It's got no GUI at all, very basic install. Uh, the small version has an LXDE. The full version has Unity. Yes, full Unity on your Android phone if you have the power. Um, <laughs> I actually couldn't get it running on my phone, so I don't know. I'm, I use the LXDE one. Um, so the, the sizes of these, these are the download sizes, 200, 400, 1.3 gig downloads for the images. And this is the size of the image once it's extracted. So like your virtual hard disk, you could think. That's, that's the size of the hard disk once it's extracted. And he also has Backtrack Linux and uh, Debian. The core is the same with no GUI. Small and large both have XFCE. And the website is pretty nice. He's got some good documentations building there. Uh, you get the downloads, there's a fact, there's videos of it running. Um, a list of working devices which, which users submit, say, hey, this version works on this device, uh, and support forums. So to install, you actually go to the website and the downloads, and I recommend you use the torrent, because although they are also on SourceForge, those are really slow, slow downloads. <laughs> The torrents ran really quickly. He's got a couple seeds up. Um, so you down, actually download that on your computer. I don't recommend you download it on your phone. Um, and then you move it over to your device. So you move this zip file containing the image to your Android device. You extract it using something like the you know, file manager. Um, you open it up. You open up the app which you've installed. So this was just the image. You've just downloaded the, the image file. And you go to launch, and you can pick which one you want to launch on the thing there. And you can set up a few things beforehand, like whether to start SSH server, the VNC server, and the screen width and height. So you're connecting via VNC. You can specify any, any uh, screen size you want. Um, so you can go like the size of your device, your device's screen. So 1280 by 720 on mine. Um, you can go bigger. And the reason you might do that is if you wanted to connect to the VNC server on your phone and use it from your computer. Or, or if you have a fancy device where you can hook it up to like HDMI, then you, can, you would, might want to do the bigger one. Um, so you hit launch, you hit start, and then it comes up. Once you've got root at localhost, you're all set. It's running. You can do all your fun Linux stuff in there, app get installs. All that. Um, and then, so this is actually like, this is your root terminal running in, running in like Android terminal or something. It pops it up for you. Uh, then you go to your VNC client, either on your computer or on your phone. I like Mocha VNC. And you hook it up and there you go. So this is, this is the uh, LXDE Ubuntu running on my phone. Pretty cool. Tiny, but so you need one that you can zoom in and out really easily. It's kind of important to pick a, a VNC client you can use. It's really useful. All right, so what can we do with this, right? We've got, now we've got a regular Linux. We can install all our desktop development stuff on there, on your phone. You can do you know, terminal windows, Vim, GUI editors, real web browsers. It's all running locally, offline on your phone. So. If you don't have a connection, you can still do all this stuff because it, it's not like you're VNCing to some server somewhere and developing. Um, a few things to watch out for if you do this. 
Uh, if, if you're using more than one image, like you're trying out a bunch of different ones, you have to reboot your phone in between. You can't just switch because it doesn't cleanly unmount all the time. So. Also, turn off the Linux screensaver if you've got a GUI because otherwise it'll just sit there and run in the background. <laughs> Um, and we run into another issue with the FAT32 cards here, right? FAT32, four gigabyte limit, Linux on Android, exists in a single file, a single disk image file. It's hard to fit a full Linux install in four gigs. So that's why the largest image is 3.5 gigs due to those limits. Um, you can get around this if you're on ext2. Really? 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, this, these are instructions for how to grow that image if you're not on a FAT32. I'm not going to go through those. But. So I did a little comparison of Bob Rubazel versus Linux on Android. Right? We got Linux. We got more Linux. They, they both have their, their ups and downs. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. You can also do this manually, not through the app. So if you want to do it yourself the hard way, the, there's instructions available for that. Now let's go to the next thing, right? Let's develop Android applications in Python on our, our regular computer, because that's the other fun thing I want to do. We're going to go back to Android scripting environment. Surprise, you can make real Android apps with that, which is pretty cool. There's a thing called the script template. So you set up your, your regular Android development environment using you know Eclipse and, and uh, ADT and all that good stuff. And then you install the script template. There's good instructions on a website at the end. Um, import that into Eclipse. You dump your SL for a script that you've maybe written somewhere else into that resources raw folder. You rename your script to script.py and you're pretty much good to go. It's not very hard. It's actually pretty easy. Then you muck around with your permissions and manifest. So there's, there's still Android stuff you have to deal with there. Um, so what this is is uh, that, uh, an example of the of the script template in an app that's ready to deploy. It's just a very basic one. It's just got the one file, the script.py. So you go and you oh I should mention here a project I have is uh, when you start developing this thing on your desktop, it's nice to have like autocomplete and all that stuff, but you don't have the Android module on your desktop, right? It's only available on the phone. So I've started a project to give you that Android API, the facades on your desktop environment. <clears throat> Come join the fun if you're interested in that. I already got one guy to uh, give me a patch. That's awesome. Uh, and that this is, it's on GitHub and this is the page. So what happens once you submit your script Right, so you send this to the Android device for testing, just like any other Android app, and boom, you get hit with this. If you don't have that installed on your phone, and it's unlikely that anyone you give this to is going to have Python installed on their phone, you come up with this dialog box, and you then have to run through all those steps. Remember, you have to download that. This will download it, but you have to go through that extra install stuff. So. You have to decide whether that's worth it to you. Are people going to do this? Some people won't do this. They'll get afraid of that, and they, you know they'll just say, "Forget your app." So it's kind of a decision you have to make about your app and, and your distributions. Um, yeah. So that that's pretty fun. That's pretty cool. We can make Android apps on our desktop. We can we can do Python on our Android phone. Um, is there is there any other way to do this? You know, maybe to get around that Python install thing. There's a program called PhoneGap, right? Wrapper around WebKit, lets you write Android apps in JavaScript and other web resources, HTML. Um, it gives you some access to the device, not nearly as much as SL4A. Oh, it can make iOS app, but we don't care. Right, and there's a program called Pyjamas, which recently had a split in the community, PyJS or Pyjamas. It's a port of the Google Web Toolkit. It converts your Python code into JavaScript. So you can run it in a browser. Why would you want to do that? I have no idea, but it's there. So, uh, hey, now we've got, and we can write applications in JavaScript, and we have a way to make our Python into JavaScript, right? Think that'll work? It does. It, it just worked. I was amazed that 
I, I compiled the pyjamas, their, uh, their hello world, their test, just dropped it into the script folder, like I said, and it worked. Boom. There is, there is Python pyjamas phone gap running on your phone. <laughs> and that was the end of my talk until the other day. This showed up. You see what that is? That is a Samsung phone running full Unity and Eclipse is running on that phone, people. Look at, the, look at how many lines you can edit on it. <laughs> so, uh, this, this just blew my mind. And of course, I got to thinking, could we run a full Android development environment in Eclipse to create SL4A Android apps, perhaps? Under Linux on Android, which is what that was using, on our Android device, and use the device itself to test those apps. So instead of the emulator, without calling forth Cthulhu, who would destroy the world. I don't know. Let's give it a try. Right, okay. Install Linux on Android, the small version, the LXDE. Update it. Inst app get install Eclipse, which is in the, uh, the Ubuntu repositories. There it is. Starting up on my phone. Boom, there it is running on my phone. So now we need to do the Android SDK. That's the next step in Android development. Download the SDK for Linux. Run Android SDK Linux tools Android. Fail. The problem is there is no ARM build of the SDK, the Android SDK. You cannot, you cannot currently run the SDK on an ARM machine. So that is where I ended up yesterday. And uh, so that's the end, kind of a disappointing end. The answer is no, you cannot do it right now. Um, I think so. I think, I think they just have to compile it, which who knows how much they have to compile. I don't know what's involved in, in the Android SDK. but uh, So once it's available, then we can go to the next step. <laughs> so there, the rest of this is just resources um, for when the slides are posted. Website, this, this book is really good. If you're going to do SL4A, Python on Android, um, Get that book because it is really good. Um, that script template, my mock API, bot brew resources, websites in the store, IRC channels, pretty nice. Uh, Linux on Android resources, there's the website. The IRC channel is also nice there. There's some cool guys in that channel. Um, there's a cool thing I was not, I did not have time to check out. It's called Kivi, and it's another way to do, to, to write mobile apps. Uh, in Python, it does iOS, it does native apps from the same code. So it's something I want to check out, but I did not have time. Has anyone tried Ch Kivi? Looked at that at all? No? Okay. It's very cool. They're, they're very focused on touch, like a touch interface stuff. So it's very neat. Um, I used a bunch of Android apps to do this, screenshots and, and screencasts. And I just wanted to give them a little shout out because it made it a lot easier. And here's my information. So questions. Yes? One of the uh, issues you mentioned very early on that you never addressed keyboard. Um, well, depending on your device, you can get a Bluetooth keyboard. Okay. If you, I mean, you can do things like that. I think there's even some USB host keyboards, but it, it totally depends on your device capabilities. Um, yeah. So given a nice keyboard and a nice monitor, can you see yourself at some point being able to use your phone as your phone? You could. Um, you know, and, and, and right now it's all a little buggy. It's all a little flaky. But I think, you know, as time goes on, these, this type of thing will mature, I hope. Anything else? Oh, OK. OK. No, I, I don't. And I, Kivi uses that underneath a different version of Python on Android, and, and programs may be able to, to bundle that with it, but I don't know how. You have one more question. Um, you said you were doing a bunch of fire with the phone, so I was wondering, you know, did it take three or two or three or I don't have any ICS, so it's all two, three. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, the question was, uh, have I tried it on any, what Android versions have I tried it on only on? 2.3, I don't have any ICS devices, so. All right, I think we're all set.